Hi there, everybody. I really can't see you, but I know you're out there. Yes, I am Carolyn Collins Peterson. I'll bring up my opening slide for you. Um, yes, I did interview a number of Star Trek captains, and I'd be happy to talk to them, talk to you about them after my talk. When Nick invited me to um, come and talk today, and he gave me the theme "Life Worth Living," I had to think about that one for a while because I had originally intended to talk about astronomy, and I decided that I'd spend my few minutes with you talking and focusing on the word "life." Um, so now we're going to talk about life and discuss the cosmic origins of life. So I want to start uh, beginning with the question, how did life get started? That's an interesting question. Well, we know it got started on this planet because here we are. And astronomers are busy looking for other worlds where life has gotten started. And we don't know that it's gotten started somewhere else. But the NASA's Kepler mission is out there looking for worlds. It's looking for other worlds in a very tiny area of space. And so far, it's found about 20, more than 2,700 exoplanets. Exoplanets are worlds around other stars. And so far, people, when they hear that, when, when it, they announce new, uh, the discovery of new exoplanets, they, we ask the question, are they Earth-like? And we ask that question because we just sort of seem to assume that Earth-like means that it'll have conditions to form life and that those are the only places life can form. Well, that may not be true. I mean, there could be a Jupiter-like world out there. We all know about Jupiter, big, massive planet, no life. But there could be a Jupiter-like world out there that does have life. We just don't know. So knowing that there are other worlds out there, those 2,700 plus, plus worlds, it's very exciting. But it doesn't really answer the question about where life came from. So life, think about it as a gift from the cosmos. The cosmos supplies the raw materials for life, and it does this using stars. Now, astronomy and astrophysics tell us how stars live, how they born, how they work, how they die. But that's only part of the story of life. The rest of the story of life comes from a science called astrobiology, and that combines astronomy, biology, chemistry, biochemistry, um, planetary science, life sciences, and it tries to figure out what conditions are necessary for life and whether or not there are other worlds with life. So think of astrobiology as a science that tries to determine where those worlds are and how they shape the life that arises on them. Well, the story of life really begins with the Big Bang. And these are the worlds, I'm sorry, I missed a slide. These are the worlds that I wanted to show you about, Earth and many of the other worlds. The story of life really begins with the Big Bang. And we don't have a good picture of the Big Bang. We kind of know what it is, so I'm just gonna show you darkness. Because anything I show you would look like an explosion. That's not really what it was. But the Big Bang was the founding event of the universe. It was the beginning of space and time. And interestingly, the Big Bang created all the hydrogen in the universe. Hydrogen is the most elemental element that we have. It also created some helium and some hydrogen. Uh, I'm sorry, lithium. And hydrogen is very important. It's part of water. We need water for life. It also bonds very easily with other elements uh, that make the molecules that, that life needs to exist. And those elements are things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So where do all those other elements come from if all the hydrogen was made in the Big Bang? Well, they come from stars. And here's how stars form other elements. They fuse hydrogen in their core, and that creates helium. The fusion process actually gives off heat and light, which is how stars shine. It's how the sun works. When stars run out of hydrogen, all of the hydrogen fuel in their cores, they begin to fuse helium. And that makes carbon, another element that we need. Now, the fusion process continues in some stars, making more and heavier elements, all the way up to iron, actually. But eventually, all stars run out of fuel in their cores. And, when, and, that's, and at that point, the fusion stops and the stars die. Now, stars die in different ways, actually, um, depending on their mass. So a really massive star explodes as a supernova, and that scatters all of the elements that it's been cooking up inside its core out to space. Now, sun-like stars, other stars like the sun, uh, they swell up to become red giants, and they lose their outer atmospheres, and they become what we call uh, planetary nebulae. 
And as they do this, all of the material that they made in their cores is also scattered out to space. Now some of this material ends up floating out in space and it becomes the raw material for new generations of stars and planets. Now, these are nebulae. These are a very important part in the story of life. You think of them as interstellar chemical factories. Um, they're filled with elements that are created in stars, but they also have water molecules, they have bits of carbon, they have sand grains, um, ice, chunks of rock, and they're very busy places. They move and they churn as they uh, float through space. Their elements mix together. They have magnetic fields threaded through them. Um, they get heated and stirred when new stars form inside them. And occasionally you'll have a, a, a supernova that explodes near one of these nebulae, and that tremendous explosion sends a shock wave through the cloud, and it also infuses the cloud with new elements that were cooked up in the supernova, in the star that blew up. So what's important for life are the chemical reactions that take place in nebulae. They create organic molecules, especially amino acids. Now what's really amazing is today we're finding, um, we're finding these prebiotics in many, many nebulae in interstellar space, in uh, these clouds of gas and dust that are in interstellar space. Now the interesting part also is how we find them. We use radio telescopes. This is uh, the, the Green Bank Telescope. I'm sorry, this is the Green Bank Telescope. Okay, where's the laser? Okay, well, never mind. That thing down there in the corner is the Green Bank Telescope in Virginia. <laughs> um, and a group of astronomers used this uh, telescope to focus in on a nebula not too far from our planet, and, and they found a whole slew of prebiotic molecules. And the way they did that is they, they sensed the radio emissions from it. There are little emissions that come out from these. And what they found were all of these molecules, and in particular, the one down at the bottom called cyanomethanamine. Now that's really a precursor to something called adenine, which is a, a, a very important component of our DNA. They also found the amino acid alanine. Now all this material is out there floating around in space and it's available to seed planets with materials that are necessary for life. Now the nebula where our solar system uh, formed obviously had access to all this material because here we are. Astronomers are studying asteroids and comets and uh, meteors that are left over from the formation of our solar system. And they're sure enough, they're finding uh, traces of organic materials and prebiotics in those objects. So here's what our early solar system looked like. We had the sun in the center, it's uh, forming very young sun, and it's surrounded by a rotating cloud of gas and dust, and it has the seeds of planets forming inside it. And let's skip forward to the formation of our own Earth. Uh, this is what early Earth looked like as it was forming. It was started out small and it uh, was formed as planetesimals crashed into it. Now these planetesimals are these small rocks that are in, in the picture here. They're crashing into it and they're made out of bits of carbon. They're made of rock, so carbon and silicon. They have prebiotic materials laced through them. They have deposits of water. And they helped build up the planet over hundreds of thousands of years. Now there were also comets crashing onto the surface of our early planet, and they most certainly brought uh, supplies of water and prebiotics. Now eventually the young Earth cooled, sorry I went too soon, and as it did, the oceans and an early atmosphere formed. And so that set the stage for the formation of life. Now nobody really knows where the first life on Earth, on Earth formed. Somewhere, somehow, it did a biochemical reaction took place and it needed a spot where conditions were just right. It's kind of like Goldilocks, not too warm, not too hot, just right. So it could have been a shallow lake somewhere or a, a tidal pool or a deep ocean vent like, like we see down on the bottom of the deep ocean. But wherever it happened, prebiotic materials mixed and they warmed and eventually they assembled together the, to, to form the first single-celled life. Now this is what our earliest ancestor probably looked like. It's called a microbial mat. So think of it as a, a colony of microbes. Now together, they created oxygen through the process of photosynthesis. And billions of years ago, colonies of animals like this created the first free oxygen for Earth's atmosphere. So from this very simple beginning, life on Earth has experienced a, a tremendous explosion of life. Um, over 3.8 billion years from these small microbes, uh, life has evolved from these to complex organisms that inhabit an astonishingly diverse array of habitats. 
So today, for example, we find microbes living in boiling hot water. Does anybody know where this is? Yeah, Yellowstone. It's, it's Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone. Every one of the colors that you see here, the yellows and the greens and the reds, those are all different microbe colonies, and they've adapted to different conditions, chemical and temperature conditions in that pool. Now, at the other end of the temperature spectrum, we have these guys. These are what I like. Um, these are basically little worms. Uh, they nestle quite happily deep in the deep ocean surface, and they live on deposits of methane ice. So each environment on Earth actually shapes the kind of life that can survive in it, from the mountains here uh, to the frigid conditions at the poles. Humans, we actually live quite happily in a number of different habitats, from the cities, have the city of Cairo down here, to this little mountain village, to farms out like, like we have out here near Fort Collins. Um, to the deserts, to, uh, to the wilderness. We pretty much can live here. We've lived on the moon briefly. Um, the deserts have their own. Oh, and three quarters of our planet is also covered with water. And so the oceans, the deep oceans and the coral reef, everything in between support an incredible diversity of life. And the deserts have their own sets of life, and as do the, as do the, um, the forest. So, our planet is really an object lesson in how life has formed and how it adapted to an extreme number of conditions, many different environments. So you have to ask, if life could get a foothold on our planet, can it actually get a foothold on some other planet? Now remember, remember I talked about the Kepler mission. It's found more than 2,700 pot potential worlds out there. There are many more to be found. They'd only looked in a very small area of space. So there are many more worlds out there, and so I'd say the odds for finding life somewhere else are pretty good. In closing, I'd like to, uh, like to end with a couple of thoughts. First of all, everything started with the Big Bang. All life started with the Big Bang. Second of all, we're all star stuff. Every single atom in your body came from some kind of star, came from stars. So think about it. Think about your eyes. Every atom in your eye was forged in a long dead star. So when you go out tonight and you look up at the sky, if it clears up, you'll see stars. And you're basically looking at the stars, you're looking at the universe. You are the universe looking back at itself. And finally, life is a big biochemistry experiment. It began some 13.8 billion years ago in the Big Bang. It continues on this planet, and it's very likely working itself out on other planets as well. And the conditions on every planet where life forms dictate the forms that that life will take. They actually guide the evolution of life. That's certainly been the case here on Earth with all the diversity of life that we have. So in a very real sense, our planet was not made for us. We were made for our planet. It shaped what we are. And it's very likely that somewhere else out there, there are other planets doing the same thing for their collections of life. Thank you.